section by first closing the question, which is the limit as x approaches 2 of the natural log of x minus 1 over x minus 2, right? Now, uh, obviously you've done a lot of work in the past, hopefully, and you have a few methods to do those, right? Um, you know, sometimes you have sort of infinite limits that are just kind of set up in a way where you can either tell them, or if you plug in, it just works out, right? Um, what's going to happen if I just plug two into this equation? Well, it, it's going to be, it's going to look undefined, right? Right? It's going to, it's approaching zero over zero, right? Because two minus one is one, natural log of one is zero. And two minus two is zero. So I kind of get this, I have a zero over zero thing, right? Now that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a value there that I kind of squeeze out, right? There could still be something at that point, right? And just as a key example, right, you should be familiar with problems like this one, which is where I take the limit as x approaches two of these couple quantum, right? Um, what would I do with a limit problem like this one? What do you suggest? What I do to the So yeah, it might be easier. It might be easier to factor this off in this case because we multiply the conjugate. It's only going to grow it a little bit more. Um, you're thinking of there's problems where you have like you know the square root of x plus you know, that sort of thing, right? Um, but in this case, we're going to factor the top. What is the top factor in this case? What is it? Um, the Uh, x plus two, x plus one, right? We'll try to put it, put it. We get x minus one, x minus one, right? You can feel free to boil that out and check it, but that is what that factors are, right? And that's the right question. Now, again, just like in this situation, this is also zero to zero, right? Because you get zero times two, one, and you get over zero. But we can actually solve this one, right? What what can I do with those x minus twos? So then I just plug two into x minus one, which gives me one. One, good. So I actually, even though it's zero over zero, or it looks like zero over zero, I can still get an answer out of it, right? And so this is what we call, this is a case of what we call an indeterminate form, okay? So I'll go ahead and write that, that title up here. And maybe we'll fill out this list. Okay. Which is kind of the part of the heading of this, uh, but the big idea is this Lobby-Tall's rule here. Because um, we can use Lobby-Tall's rule in some of these indeterminate forms. Okay, so this is the same indeterminate form that I could find this. Do we know what this one is? Now, limit is x to zero of sine x direct. It's still zero over zero, but we know this one as well. Uh, hopefully, in your calculus class, I know probably some of you took the top a lot. I'm not sure if you're. Other, like who else you guys might take it with as well, but um, in the book, and they probably would have explained, we have arguments to show what this is. This limit is one. Um, if you're interested as to what that is, um, it's a great book for you. Anyway, <laughs> so we get one, right? But we don't need, like, we still have ways to do it without, um, you know, that. Even though it's zero or zero, we can work with this. We don't really have anything as neat with this one, or we don't really have any sort of nice argument we can say anything about this. Okay, but it's still going to have a nice value. Okay, and what we're going to find is there's going to be cases, and they're going to be these indeterminate forms. And again, what I mean by indeterminate forms is a form where I have, you know, you can't really say what it is just from looking at it, right? Like if I have one over zero right, in my limits. I can say, oh, well, that's going to approach infinity of some sort, right? We've kind of talked through this. we through that. That's going to be an infinite number of some kind, right? But zero over zero, in these cases, I don't know. And so I'm going to put that in our list here. Zero over zero is a, oh, no, what am I doing? That's wrong. 
right? Like I can't say anything about it just from looking at it. Another indeterminate form. Okay. Now, it's still possible that these limits could have problems, but as it stands, you can't say anything about them. So we need to work with them a little more to see if we can um, work with it to get an answer out. Okay. And what ends up being the case is there's this neat little rule, which I'll, if we have time, I'll, I might try to prove a little bit at the end of the class, but um, for now we're just going to use it. And this rule is called what we call school. It's pronounced what we call school. It kind of looks like hospital, I know. Um, it's a French name. Um, that's just how it's pronounced. So what we call is the idea. Um, so I guess I won't be able to figure say what hospital is for you. Anyway. So this rule, and I'm being correct, right, the story right there, says that, right, if I don't know what exact, if I have an indeterminate form, right, like zero to zero under infinity or infinity, there's a lot more, we'll get to them, then the limit as x approaches zero, or, well, actually, let me, it's, I think in general, it's just a, it's any number. The limit as x approaches a, of f of x over g of x, right? So I have some function on the top and I have some function on the bottom. If it is in this indeterminate form, then, or zero, zero, infinity over infinity in this case, then I can take the limit of this thing as x approaches a. This is equivalent to the limit as x approaches a, not of f over g, but of f prime over g prime. Okay. Now this is like the idealized quotient rule for everybody, where it just oh, I just take the derivative of the top and bottom. Um, but this only works for limits. This only works when you're working with limits. Okay. Where I take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom, and the limits here is actually going to be the same. Now the reason for that, right? The reason why this works, and again, there's right, we can might show it at the end, but. Um, just as a general idea, right? When we're talking about limits, I'm not as interested in what the exact value is of the function, right? Because there's not one there. That's why we're doing the limit in the first place, right? But I also want to study the behavior of the function, right? And the behavior of the function can also be understood through its derivatives, right? And so I can use the derivatives in place of the functions themselves to still have an understanding of what the limit is in that form. But that's only if we're experiencing this time, okay? For now, at least. Everything comes back to these in some way, but um, it has to be just in these forms, and we'll cover like some differences and sort of thing. But this is what we need to have, okay? As long as it's an indeterminate form, and I'll put that list out again. This is. Okay. So make sure you write that down because. This section of the book is this is the work you're going to be doing is this thing over and over again. Okay, so know it, um, use it. Um, you could actually use it here and get the same answer. Um, don't use it here, it's legal. <laughs> so it, it, it technically works, but I wouldn't be talking about it if you didn't have it. Anyway, we're going to move on. So let's go to our limit, right? That we have at the beginning, right? So here's our. Right, first example, we're going to take the limit as x approaches 2 of the natural log of x minus 1 over x minus 2. Okay, so I want to find what this limit is. Okay, and right now I can't do anything with it. I don't have, I can't cancel out any polynomials. I don't have any special tricks. I just have this, right? But we've already established that this approaches 0 over 0, right? So I can use L'Hopital's rule in the central, right? So to do that, of course, I need to take the derivative of the top model, okay? So let's do that. So I'm going to change this limit to see if I can get any answers out of it to make any sense of it. So it's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches to of f prime. So what is f prime going to be? One over x minus one. 
So it's just 1 over x minus 1, right? Because the derivative of x minus 1 is 1, so it just stays the same, okay? What's the derivative of x minus 2? 1. It's just 1. Fantastic. So this is just the limit as x approaches 2 of Can I plug in two now? Sure. What is it? One. One. How about that? So again, when we look at it at first, we get zero over zero. It's like one over two. But in reality, it does actually have a value there. That's the number one. And using L'Hopital's rule, we could figure it out. Okay. Awesome. Example number two. approaches infinity of x cubed okay do we have an indeterminate form yes we do what form is it good because if I plug infinity into x cubed it's going to shoot towards infinity and e to the two times infinity is going to shoot towards infinity right so this is of the form infinity over infinity, right? Where this one will have infinity zero over zero. Okay. So that's important to recognize. I think on the homework assignment, I have you kind of write out what form it is. So because I want you to kind of be in that place, feel like, oh, it's this form, so I can use it. Okay, and that'll be important uh, for the talk about this. Okay, so it's in an indeterminate form, so I can use L'Hopital's rule. So L'Hopital's rule says. That I can take the derivative of the top and bottom. What do I get when I take the derivative of the top and bottom? What's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared, thank you. What's the derivative of e to the 2x? Thank you. Okay. Can I get an answer now? No. Why not? No. It's still indeterminate. But since it's still indeterminate, I can use it again. So let's do it again. What is, so let's do the derivative of the top and bottom. What's the derivative of 3x squared? 2x squared. Derivative of 2e to the 2x. Or e. Thank you. So I get this. All right, now can I get an answer? No. Ah, darn. Okay. So we need to go again. Right? That's okay. As long as it's still in an indeterminate form, which is in each of these cases, it's still infinity over infinity, and this is still infinity over infinity, I can still use it again and again. So now, what's the derivative of 6x? And what's the derivative of 4 e to the 2x? Awesome. Now, can I get an answer out of this? Absolutely. That's zero. It's going to be zero. Done. Because 6 is just there, right? It's just. You know, but I have it over 80 to the 2x, which is going to shoot towards infinity, right? It's going to keep growing, right? So I have 6 over infinity, which is going to approach. Does that make sense? We see that? Okay. So feel free, as long as it's still in an indeterminate form, to use L'Hopital's rule as many times as, as you want. Okay? I could have made this problem worse, and I could have made it be like next to the center power. Wouldn't that, that would have been bad. Anyway. <laughs> Awesome. Let's go to another one. Okay, so the next one I have here is the limit as x approaches pi. And we're going to approach pi from the, let's see, the right side. X minus pi over cosine x. What is pi minus pi? Zero. zero. Yep. It's just zero. What is cosine of pi? Right. Negative one. What's negative one plus one? Zero. So we have an indeterminate form, still in this case, which is zero over zero. Okay. So I could use L'Hopital's rule. So if I use L'Hopital's rule, what am I going to get? 
What is my instruction going to be? One over that, and then what's the good? Thank you, sorry. Great, so then I can just use the dolls roll again, right? And then we'll get uh, the cosine, right? So then, but then I'm just going to zero, right? Isn't that great? Are we good? Is that right? Is that okay? Can I do that? So I don't yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so why did it, so like, I thought it would be like, no, that's no, you're right. I, I did that. I did that on purpose. I was just joking. That's not <laughs> this is not right. Okay. But if you're not if you're not looking and thinking clearly, right, you're gonna do this problem, you're like, oh, I'll just keep going. Oh, I got zero. Look, it's just zero. But that's this is incorrect. This is not the right answer. Okay. This is not indeterminate form. You're correct. This is one over zero. That's not indeterminate form. So yes, this is this is infinity. Right, um, especially since so we have we need to think about it a bit more because we have pi from the right side. So I'm approaching. Um, so we have sine x, and I'm approaching pi from its right side. Right now, sine. So let's think about the sine graph real quick. Just to remind ourselves. So this is the point we're talking about here, and we're approaching it from the right side. So if I'm approaching it from the right side, my values of sine are going to be negative or positive. They're going to be negative, right? But there's a negative side here, so it just becomes positive, right? So I have a positive number over a positive number, so this is going to approach positive. Okay, you should be uh, that. I think there's a good portion of the first chapter that was talking a little bit about like infinite limits, so you might want to review that. Um, but yes, since this is not an indeterminate form, I have to use other methods to do it. Okay, so this is wrong. That's good. Um, don't do that. It's very bad because um, it's not zero, right? It's supposed to be infinity. And if you put it on the calculator, you'll see that it's it is supposed to be infinity. Okay, so be careful. Yes. Will we be like uh, we could leave it one over zero instead of three? If you leave it as like this instead of this, yeah, because because it, it depends, right? I mean, if I because even if I just did pi from the left side instead, it would have been negative infinity instead of positive. Right, but you would still written one over zero. So you really need to think about it. And, and you know, just, just kind of remember to look at the graph and see what the values are doing. You just see, oh, it's positive over positive, but it'll be positive. Okay, question zero on that. Got it? Okay, not too bad. Just be careful. Okay, so, uh, I think, you know, right before we went on our break, we said this is a abused rule on that, just because let's just keep doing it, you know? Um, it's also funny. Um, you guys are allowed to do it now. But, um, I taught a Calc 1 class for technology last semester, and I had students that were using this rule, but they didn't learn it. So <laughs> this is one that you find often, like you if you Google it, you know, it'll pop up and catch students really easily who are just like, oh, I need to find this limit. I'm not going to use what you taught in class and just <laughs> find another way. So we know something. Let's see. Okay, next part. So, um, besides just having division, we also have other indeterminate forms which aren't just like this, but are um, products, like we're multiplying things, right? And these forms can come in a couple of different, a couple of different ways. Um, just depending on what f is and what g is. But if I have a limit where I'm taking, I'm multiplying two things, and the limit of the one thing is zero, but the limit of the other thing is infinity, I can't say anything. I, I don't know, right? Because it could be possible, right, that the one thing, as the one thing, like depending on how much the one thing increases and how much the other thing decreases, they could cancel each other out to where I can still get a value out of it, right? So at first you might just be like, well, it's zero. Well, we don't know, right? Because what if, here, I'll just give you like, you, know, you could 
it, it might be going down to zero, but you have something like this, right? But if I multiply, you know, it's like, oh, well, it's so close to zero. But if I multiply this by a thousand, this is still the number one, right? It still kind of cancels each other. So you can't make any assumptions on that. We have to work with it, okay? So I'm going to show you a, an example um, where we have an indeterminate form of terms, okay? And that is very similar to our starting one, uh, but that's okay. So we're going to have four. The limit as x approaches one from the right side of x minus one times the natural log. Well, um, you know, uh, just talking about, oh, I mean, it's a nice and determinate form, I'm sure. Um, but what do we do first, right? Um, if you plug in the numbers, right, what is, what's one minus one going to be? That's zero. But if I plug one from the right into this natural log, right, one minus one is supposed to be zero, right? But we're, and we're approaching, so we're approaching zero, and that's going to be from the right side. The natural log, remember, decreases very heavily as it goes down to zero. So it's actually going towards negative infinity, which if it's negative or positive, it doesn't matter. It's still infinity. Um, so we have our, our situation here. So we need to do something with this um, to be able to, you know, maybe use Louis Tall's rule on it somehow, right? But Louis Tall's rule only applies to this division case. So how do I work it out here? Good. Absolutely. So, so let me write that out real fast. So we're going to get we have natural log of x minus one over x minus one to the negative first power. Right. Notice if I apply the negative one, right, and I, I flip it back, I get the same thing. Right. And maybe even better, the way to look at this, I'm going to have the natural log of x minus one over one over x minus one, right? Because that's how that's how I can write that in one. Okay, this is what we want to do. Reason being, right? We already established this goes towards negative infinity. If we have one over x minus one, that's one over zero, which is infinity, which is or positive, positive or negative, negative, which is one of our indeterminate forms, right? In the division case, in general, right? If I have, and the book talks about this, if I have a uh, of x times two x, right? And I have this, you know, zero infinity case, or I have infinity zero, whichever. Um, then I want to take one of these, and I want to write something like this, right? So I take g of x and over one of x, right? Because if I, right, anytime I have a number, right, even if you know, just to show you simply, four is the same thing as one over one fourth. That will flip back up and get the same thing. That's the exact thing here, right? This is going to put this into a form where I can do it um, with what we call it. And very similarly, I could also do f of x. Right? Depending on uh, you really pick whichever is what's most convenient. Obviously, I think putting the x minus 1 down there is more convenient to do it than actual log. Except for this might get a little constrained. But we have this. So now I can use Louis Tall's rule on this. So let's do that. If I use Louis Tall's rule on this, what is the derivative of the top going to be? Thank you. And we can make sure the limit's still there, right? We want to get the limit. Okay. What is the derivative of 1 over x minus 1? Absolutely. Right? And if you want to work through that, right, just remember I would want all right. So um, one over x minus one is the same thing as x minus one to the negative first power. And when I take the derivative, I take the, the exponent, right? So the derivative of x minus one to the negative first power is the negative one times x minus one to the negative one minus one, which is negative two. 
times the derivative of the inside, which is just one in this case. And so that would give me this by proving that. Okay. Now, I don't like all these fractions here, you know, at least for now, so I might try to rewrite it. Um, so if I do a little bit of key change flip, um, what's going to happen to my fraction here? What am I going to get? Um, not negative x minus 1 squared, it should just be negative just x minus 1, right? Because this is going to flip up. One of them will cancel out. So, yeah. so we're just left with negative x minus 1. Okay? And we want one to the right. But now I can just plug one in, right? What's 1 minus 1? Fantastic. So we just have negative 0, so we just end up with 0. Okay? So if you have this indeterminate product, which should be in this form, 0 times infinity or infinity times 0, um, then you can rewrite it to the formula. Okay? Awesome. Next sort of indeterminate form we have um, is like this infinity minus infinity. Okay, so now we're, we're not worried about a product, now we're worried about a difference. Right? I can't really tell what's happening there. Right? It could be that, you know, this infinity is a lot smaller than this one, right? Or whatever that function is. And so that this one still dominates, so it's still bigger. Right? But it could be possible that this infinity is bigger, so that one dominates and it's negative. Or they could actually be the same size. About the same size at that point, or you know, approximately. So they both are going to cancel out evenly, are going to give us a value, right? So that's an indeterminate form because we can't say anything about it. So, again, you know, most helpful thing is let us do some examples um, so we can see when this case sort of happens. So, This is going to be the limit as x approaches zero of cosecant x minus cosecant x. Okay. So why is this? Why is this in the indeterminate form? Let's roll with closing it. Okay. That's zero. Right. Because they're both divided by sine. Right? You know, it's cosine is one over sine, and cotangent is cosine over sine. Right? So they're both sine at zero is zero, so they're both over zero. So those are going to be some sort of infinities. Right? So we're in, we have this form of infinity. So it's an indeterminate form, so we need to change this somehow, right? The theme of this section is Lobitol's rule. So we ultimately want to get this back to Lobitol's rule somehow, right? But as we already mentioned, sine's involved in both of these somehow, right? So someone tell me again, how can I rewrite cosecant in terms of sine and cosine? Whatever, whatever sine. How can I rewrite cotangent in terms of sine and cosine? Thank you. Gives us the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine x. Okay. Great. What an indeterminate form do we have now? We have zero over zero. So we can use Lobitel's rule. What, what do I get when I use Lobitel's rule here? Yeah, so um, if you just plug straight in, you get zero, right? Or if you say, oh, sine over cosine is tangent, tangent is zero, so zero. So this is it. Okay, 
So these are these infinities are almost the same size essentially, and it goes to zero. Okay, so there's just a quick example of that case again. So um, these four so far, right, are the ones to look out for. Um, and you would hope that you know you would have a case where you know these are going to turn into these two in some way, right? So you can use totally complicated things. But obviously, if it's in it, in an indeterminate form, you hope that it could probably be true. Okay. So the last possible combination, right? Um, we don't need to worry about infinity plus infinity, right? If I add two infinities, that's what you can say the right? That's what you can do there. Um, so we don't need to worry about a sum. Um, we've got the body, we've got both point. But what we haven't done, we haven't done exponents. So the last kind of indeterminate forms that we have is ones where I'm dealing with something where I have f of x raised to the g of x power. Okay. Now, some of these, like, sometimes you can plug in, you can see directly what's going to happen, right? Like, if I have zero, right, raised to the infinity power. That's probably going to be zero, right? If it's even if it's close to zero, right, then it's just going to make, make, keep making it smaller, right? So it's going to turn to be zero. So that one's not an indeterminate form. Three indeterminate form. We actually have three though, um, which are maybe I'll list them on the side here. The first is zero to the zero power. Okay, we don't always know what this is. It depends sometimes. Um, your first guess might be to say, oh, well, it's one, right? Anything to the zero power of one. Um, you need to be careful there, right? Um, but if both functions are zero, then you need to do a little bit of work to modify it, okay? The second type is infinity to the zero, right? So this is, this is a bit similar to the discussion we were talking about with this, you know, infinity minus infinity thing, right? Um, depending on, you know, this thing is going to keep getting bigger, right? So it's getting large. And even as this thing's approaching zero, technically, you know, you think, oh, well, everything, I mean, same thing with this case. Everything to the zero, like, in, if you just have a number, it's obviously going to be zero. But if you're dealing with infinity, things might cancel out a lot. So you can't say anything for sure. So you need to check. And the last type, it's one to the infinity. Okay, so these are the three types of indeterminate forms you're going to have in the power. Anything else should be easy to determine, or you should be able to look at it and tell. But these ones you can't tell. Okay? Ones in the infinity may not be one, right? Because even if you're this much off from one, right? If I have 1.00001, right, and I take that to the infinite power, it's going to go towards infinity, right? So, we can't say anything and we need to do a little bit of work to figure this out. So, how do we do this? Well, we have two options. The first option is going to be that I take, so I'm going to take this limit and I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it y. The limit is x to a x. To the G now my goal is to bring, I want that G of X to come down, right? Because then from there I have an easier form that I might be able to work with. So what function would be able to bring that power down into it? Natural logarithm. Okay? That's why we keep talking about it this whole time, right? I want to take the natural log of both sides. Uh, which we also mentioned the other day, this natural log can kind of face with this limit to this continuous function. So I'm going to get the natural log of y equals the limit as x approaches a of f of x times the natural log. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> some some kind of wrong way I said that. So I get this, right? 
which should, in this case, you know, it, it might be easy to determine at this point, but it may be if the type saver comes made. So then from there, you would use your, your tools here to figure this out, figure this limit out, evaluate it. And then once you have that, right, so let's say you get this to be L, this number to be L over here, we can find it using the result. Then you have the natural log of y equals L. So how would I find the y? If I only can't stop natural log, I use E. So I'm going to get y is E to whatever that was. Okay? And so that would be it. Another way is just to say, right? And, and again, this, this, this might feel a little familiar to like doing the logarithmic differentiation stuff. Because um, I mentioned this as well, but I could just take what I have, my limit, and rewrite it as the limit is x approaches a of e to the g of x times the natural log. Right? Because the natural log and e would cancel out and that come back down. And with it being in this form, e is a continuous function, so I can take the limit and bring it up. And then I'd evaluate here, which would just give me e to the L. Okay, so sorry, whichever way you prefer is fine. But ultimately, we would need to figure out what the limit of this is, right? And then once we know that, um, I can just say raise it to the uh, but e is just basic. You know. Okay, so that's how we we'll solve those, and we're going to do a quick example to demonstrate that. So we'll go here. Okay, example number six. I'm going to take the limit of x over x approaches zero from the Okay, so what form is this? Zero to zero. Good. So this is indeterminate. So um, we'll want to use one of those two methods over there. Does anybody have a, do we have a preference here? Would you prefer to do one or two? Ideas here. Anybody just wants to run one, two. Okay. You like one better? One. Okay. Thank you. So I'm gonna call this limit y, right? And then we want to bring that power down. Right? So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides, um, which as we talked about over there, this is going to come through and that power is going to come down. So I'm going to get the natural log of y is the limit of x over zero from the right of the square root of x times the natural log of x. Are we following so far on that? Is that good? Okay. So what should I do to evaluate this one? Yeah. Yeah. So we can say I put x to the negative one half down there, or I can say maybe one over the square root of x, just for the sake of like, well, right. I guess the derivative would be two or five. So yes, this is the same thing. One over the square root of x or x. So, is this still an indeterminate form here? No. Good. So, I can use Lobby rule on it. So, if I use Lobby rule, what do I get? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Over. So, let's do a little bit of work on this. So, this is. 1 over x over negative 1 over 2 times x to the positive half power. 
right? Because I can just take that and flip it down to the zombie equals to two. And then the key change flip. So I'm going to get one over x times negative two x to the three minus one. And of course, it should be able to. What is x to the 3 halves divided by x? Limit of negative 2 x to the 1 half power. What do I get with a 0 x? Awesome. Am I done? 0, do we get it? Are we done? Is that the whole problem? So the natural log of y, right? We didn't find y, we found the natural log of y. So how do I find y? Mm -hmm. So I have natural log of y equals zero. So we're going to get y equals e to the zero and e to the one. So this limit. Okay. That makes sense. Good there. Okay. You know, practice with those and um, work through it. Um, awesome. Uh, if there's anything else, um, maybe I'll skip on the, the group right now since we have a couple minutes. So I'll, I'll spare you on that one for now. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this also kind of brings back to the, um, I think we, you know, in the last section we talked about. Um, In the limit of this thing, we get e, and you can use what we call the rule with this power stuff to, to show that that's the case. Okay, so this is an exercise you can do that. Yes, we will be doing that tomorrow. So I went ahead and did 6.8 because I don't think you need 6.6 and 6.7 for that. Um, I wanted to group 6.6 and 6.7 together because they're of a very similar nature. So, so 6.6 is about um, inverse trace functions. And 6.7 is about something we would call hyperbole trig functions. Uh, so they're both in the same way. So I said, let's do those together and then do these things. And I figured 6.5 would take longer than I don't think I'm going to take longer than that. this one. Thank you for watching.